Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for sticking around. I, I hope the caffeine is, uh, is still percolating. It's really been an incredible uh, set of talks. I feel like uh, it's been drinking from a fire hose a little bit. I want to thank Marsha and Bill for sponsoring this and, uh, and including me. Um, all right. So um, I'm going to touch very briefly on a couple of things, epidemiology of Alzheimer's disease, the basic genetics of Alzheimer's, and then really hone in on um, three su uh, studies that we've undertaken, two related to APOE, one's published, one may never see the light of day, but I'll show it to you anyway, um, and then one on uh, looking at genetics involved with the X chromosome, which I hope will be published shortly, but it's currently unpublished, so kind of uh, not even off the presses. Um, and then just touch a little bit on, on things that we'd like to do further and, and that I think the field would uh, benefit from uh, doing more work in. All right, um, so this is the case. Most Alzheimer's disease patients are women, um, but this can get cut uh, and, and sort of analyzed in a couple different ways. So prevalence, just as a brief reminder about epidemiological terms, is um, the total number of, of people that have something. And so the total number of, of um, women with Alzheimer's disease is greater than the number of men. Um, and estimates vary a little bit. Um, the, the sort of less conservative suggests that it's a two to one ratio. I think uh, a little more realistically three to two, but certainly a big difference uh, in terms of prevalence. Um, and this is presumed to, to be due mostly to the fact that women still, uh, across different societies and, and ancestral backgrounds, live longer than men. And age is the biggest risk, risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So this is pretty straightforward. And there's biology in here, but it's probably not Alzheimer's specific biology. It's biology about longevity, which is you know important and, and other people might be interested in that, and um, uh, worth, that, that's worth pursuing. But what I'm really more interested in is whether or not, um, if you kind of control for age and control for longevity, are women still at increased risk for Alzheimer's disease? And so for this, you can look at things like incidence, which is the number of new cases per year, say in a given um, you know, um, decile of age range, for example. And here the data are, are a little bit less clear than the prevalence data. So it looks like, um, in a nice big review by the group at Mayo, um, actually men appear to have a higher incidence of developing Alzheimer's disease, new, new cases per year, in a younger age group, so under 80. When you get up over 80, even controlling for longevity issues, it looks like um, the incidence is higher in women. And so here, this biology is probably a little more Alzheimer's specific, because you're sort of controlling for the longevity issues. Um, although even here, there are a whole lot of things that are wrapped up in here, cardiovascular risk, um, things that differ between men and women, and that can affect the diagnosis of dementia, even if it's not Alzheimer's clinically, like vascular dementia getting confounded with Alzheimer's. Um, so uh, in, when thinking about these sex-based differences, I wanted to draw this distinction that was drawn earlier between sex-based differences and gender-based differences. And this looms, I think, fairly large in Alzheimer's disease. So we can highlight a couple presumed sex-based differences. So the hormonal milieu is very different in men and women uh, across the lifespan, um, and maybe a little less different after menopause, which is a big area of, of research interest in Alzheimer's. Uh, and then, in, very importantly, as, as David's talk so nicely illustrated, there uh, are a lot of X chromosome genes that are very critical for uh, normal cognitive function, and these could be playing a role. But then we can also think about gender-based differences in risk factors. So, um, for example, it's, it's certainly the case in the U.S. that men are more likely to experience heavy-duty head trauma, which is one of the few consistent and replicable uh, risk factors, uh, environmental risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and at least in these older generations that are now coming into the, the um, uh, risk uh, age, education offers, often differed between men and women. So men would be, uh, have more years of education, which can be sort of protective, we think. There's a bit of a um, protective effect against Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. Um, and so there's just two, you know, two, two or three examples of how we can think about sex-based differences versus gender-based differences, which is a distinction that I never really even considered much until um, getting more exposure to, to Marsha and, and the work that she's done. And this is, you know, an important way to parse this out, I think. All right. So just a word or two about the genetics of Alzheimer's disease. If you haven't seen this sort of graph before, effect sizes on the y-axis and the sort of frequency or the commonness of the, the particular genetic allele. Um, uh, polymorphism is on the um, x-axis. And so there are three genes that cause autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease at a very early age. These are monogenic disorders. They don't play a big role in the clinical world, but they help us think about the um, molecular pathways. Um, and then on the far right here are a whole bunch of recent um, hits that have come out of these GWAS studies with 70, you know, 70,000 subjects, for example. These tend to be very common, but their effect size, uh, any one in, in isolation, is very small. And then what we have kind of in the middle, which is a, sort of a gift to Alzheimer's disease, is not true of most complex disorders, is a gene, APOE, that falls kind of in between these two. So APOE is 
pretty common. About 10% of people in this room will have one copy, and it has a very strong effect size on Alzheimer's disease. Not as big as, as uh, presenolin 1, for example, but way uh, stronger than these other more common polymorphisms. So we're going to talk a fair bit about APOE. This is what you see when, when we look at these Manhattan plots. So this is from a 2013 Nature Genetics study, 74,000 subjects, and APOE always sort of dwarfs the, the skyline on these Manhattan plots. The only thing that really comes close is bin 1, and this is really because this is a much more common polymorphism. The effect, the effect size of bin 1 is much smaller than APOE, but it, it makes its way up there because it's more common. Um, but this is true of, of essentially all uh, Alzheimer's GBOS studies, is that every, APOE kind of dwarfs uh, everything else. Um, so the basics about APOE that are important when we consider the, the studies I'll show you from our group, it comes in three flavors, unfortunately named APOE 2, 3, and 4, instead of 1, 2, and 3. That's just <laughs> got to deal with it. Four is the allele that uh, increases risk. So I mentioned about 10% of people in this room will have one E4 allele. About 50% of Alzheimer's patients will have one E4 allele, so it's overrepresented. Um, and APOE2 is actually protective, but that's the, the rarest um, allele. Having an APOE4, one APOE4 allele or two will move the age of onset earlier, so you might get sick at 60 instead of at 75 or 80. It's not really useful as a general screening tool, and this is important and something that I like to sort of um, uh, reiterate. Uh, because it's just not potent enough. And so a 55-year-old, there's really no reason to know your APOE4 status at this point. One day, that may become relevant, um, but we're not there yet. Um, the E4 effect has been, like most things, you know, for better or for worse, studied mainly in Caucasian groups, um, but it looks like its uh, effect is attenuated in different ancestral backgrounds. So Richard Mayhew, for example, at Columbia has done a lot of work uh, in uh, Afro-Caribbeans, and it looks there as though the effect is present, but, but a little weaker. Um, and really, the only time we use this in the clinic is to uh, increase our specificity. So if I see a 60-year-old person, they have a slightly atypical presentation, I'm still worried about Alzheimer's, I might get APOE genotyping on that person. Uh, and if they have one or certainly two APOE4 alleles, that really ups my, my clinical certainty. All right. So the one thing that we've learned a lot about uh, in, in terms of APOE and how it increases risk for Alzheimer's is, is its effect on amyloid processing. Um, these are really wonderful data from the group at Wash U in St. Louis. Um, on the y-axis, you'll see the percent of subjects that are amyloid positive. This is a PET scan, basically. Uh, and then this is split up by, um, you know, age on the x-axis, and then red and, and black are E4 carriers in red, uh, and those that are E4 negative in black. The important thing to point out here is that these are all healthy older subjects. This isn't Alzheimer's disease. These are healthy 70-year-olds, healthy 75-year-olds. And what you'll see is that you know, 30% or so of, uh, if you look at the 60 to 69 range, 36% of APOE4 carriers in that age range are amyloid positive. Even though they have normal memory at this point, their brain is, is filled with amyloid plaque. Uh, and that effect gets bigger and bigger with each, um, uh, incre you know, 10-year increase in age. Uh, and really, there's very little e among healthy controls. If you don't have an E4 allele, it's pretty unlikely, actually, even in your 80s, that you're going to be amyloid positive. So E4 really drives misprocessing of amyloid. That's one thing that's very clear and, and been replicated by a number of groups. All right, so what does this have to do with um, sex? So this is a remarkable meta-analysis from 1997. You'll notice that this is not in the Lithuanian Journal of Neuroscience. I'm Lithuanian, so I can say that. This is in JAMA. This is a very, you know, this is about as big as it gets. And it's in 1997. I had been, uh, you know, a behavioral neurologist practicing, occasionally getting APOE genotypes for 10 years before I even saw this um, figure, uh, which happily Tony weiss Corey, one of our, our colleagues here, was, was showing in one of his talks on Alzheimer's. And I, I kept kind of re-looking at this. It kind of blew my mind. I'll walk you through it. Um, but basically, this is the odds ratio, the likelihood that you'll develop Alzheimer's disease um, with age on the x-axis. And the, the odds ratio of one is compared basically to APOE3 homozygotes, so the, the risk neutral sort of background. And then it's split by sex and, and by the number of um, APOE4 alleles. So if you look at the bottom, the, the white circles there, these are men that carry one copy of APOE4. Their risk compared to men that carry two copies of APOE3, and they really don't bump their risk up at all. Um, if you're a woman, that's the next line up in, in the triangles, and you carry one copy of the E4. Uh, allele, your risk jumps up about fourfold. Now, if you carry two copies, whether you're a man, that's the third line up, or a woman, the fourth line up, your risk really jumps about eight to tenfold. But even there, women look like they do a little worse with APOE4 allele. So I saw these data. I'd never seen them before. Um, I was wondering why this paper didn't get discussed more. I, I still don't know the answer to that. Um, but we wanted to look at this 
um, you know, in, in data that we had access to. Um, and to do that, we took a large data set from the National Alzheimer's um, Coordinating Center, or NAC. These are data that all the Alzheimer's disease research centers, um, uh, when they see patients, they fill out these uniform uh, assessments and they contribute the data to the NAC. So you can write, you know, a two-paragraph proposal of what you'd like to look at, and the NAC will send you data on, in this case, um, what is that there, about 4,500 older controls and their change uh, in cognition over time. Um, and so the question we wanted to ask is, do we see a differential effect of this ApoE4 gene in men compared to women in the risk from converting from a healthy person at age 70 to, say, mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease? So very straightforward sex by ApoE uh, interaction analysis. And this is what we found. Um, so, I guess in, in uh, recognition of International Women's Day, women are in red here, thankfully, and men are in blue. Um, and the, the uh, dashed lines are the E4 carriers and the solid lines are the, the E3 carriers. And this is just looking at, at the effect of one copy of E4. Um, and so what you see is there's a, a pretty wide spread between the two red lines, right? That's the effect of the E4 allele on women in terms of going from healthy aging to either mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease. And an E4 allele in a woman drives that um, uh, conversion much more quickly. The men in blue don't, very, don't differ very much. Um, and you can look at the uh, hazard ratios there in the little inset. It's significant in women. The E4 effect increases the risk of conversion about 1.8-fold. And in men, there was no significant effect with one E4 allele on converting from healthy aging into mild cognitive impairment uh, or Alzheimer's disease. The next thing we, we asked was, well, what about people who already have mild cognitive impairment? This is kind of a way station to Alzheimer's disease. Um, and you can set up the same analysis. This time there were 2,000 people that started with MCI. And if you look at the conversion over time, longitudinally to Alzheimer's disease, again, the, the gap uh, between the two red lines is bigger, basically, than the gap between the two blue lines, meaning that the E4 effect uh, is more prominent in women. It's, it's driving. Um, conversion to MCI, uh, or, I'm sorry, to Alzheimer's disease in this case, um, more so than in men. If you look at the inset again, these hazard ratios in red, in women, MCI, um, E4 carries risk of conversion is about twofold, and men it's about 1.5-fold. So it's there in men, it's significant in men, but it's, it's less significant. Um, so both for converting from healthy aging to MCI or from MCI to Alzheimer's disease in separate subjects, the E4 effect was larger in women um, than in men. Um, and this was replicated in a much smaller study, but it's always nice to see other groups looking at this. Um, and then the next question that we asked is, well, can we start to get a sense uh, about how this affects the underlying molecular uh, pathways in, in Alzheimer's pathogenesis? And here we were able to use the uh, ADNI data. So this is, again, publicly available data, the Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging uh, initiative data. And here we're looking at spinal fluid uh, protein levels. So the, the classic sort of biomarker profile in Alzheimer's disease is that tau, uh, one of the two proteins we think about, is elevated in the spinal fluid of Alzheimer's patients. And amyloid is actually low in the spinal fluid of Alzheimer's patients compared to uh, healthy controls. Um, and so what we're looking at here is the effect of APOE um, by sex on amyloid levels. In the, on the far left, healthy controls, and on the right, uh, mild cognitive impairment patients. And basically what you see is that uh, having an E4 allele drives amyloid uh, down in the spinal fluid, whether you're a man or a woman. There was no difference in the effect of um, ApoE4 on amyloid. So these people look more like Alzheimer's disease patients, even though they're either healthy or just in the mild cognitive impairment patient. If you have an E4 allele, your amyloid levels get uh, driven downwards. When you looked at tau, however, there was a, a difference. So in controls, um, there's no real difference between men and women, whether you're non-E4 or E4, but at the MCI stage, women now have a greater increase uh, with the E4 allele in their tau levels um, compared to men. Men go up, but, but not very substantially, and women go up quite a bit, um, and this was significant. So, you know, this is incomplete data. This is cross-sectional. It doesn't give us the full story, but it does suggest one of two possibilities, I think. Either, even though it looks as though the effect on amyloid is very similar, uh, you know, E4 drives amyloid down, whether you're uh, a man or a woman, it's possible that the E4 has been lower longer in women, right? This is cross-sectional data. It may be that women have had low E4, or I'm sorry, low amyloid for 10 years prior to this analysis, um, and, and men are just recently uh, getting their, their amyloid levels lowered. We think that amyloid precedes the other changes by about 10 or 15 years, so you have to have abnormal amyloid uh, in the brain for about 5, 10, 15 years before you start to see these changes in tau. So that's one possibility. 
The other possibility is that the effect of ApoE4 on amyloid is totally identical between men and women, um, and it's the downstream effects after amyloid misprocessing takes place um, that differs, and that's where we see these tau changes, for example. And I think those are totally, um, uh, you know, reasonable uh, hypotheses, both of them, and a little hard to get at with this sort of data. All right. So um, one of the things that, that the Wisdom um, pilot grant that we had actually allowed us to do was to ask this question, well, if there's this differential effect of APOE on, on risk of Alzheimer's disease, is it possible that APOE4 is interacting with other genes differently in men compared to women? That, I think when I say it like that, it sounds fairly straightforward, but what that amounts to in a big GWAS is an APOE by sex by SNP interaction, which is a three-way interaction, which is challenging, uh, but really the question is, do we see genes that interact differently, you know, with APOE in men compared to uh, women? Um, and so to do that, we, uh, again, sort of taking advantage, it sounds a little parasitic. We have contributed data to some of these things, but we've also benefited a lot from these public data uh, uh, bases. So this was using the Alzheimer's Disease Genetics Consortium data. Um, this is data from 15 centers, about 22,000 subjects, pretty evenly split between cases and controls, uh, more women than men. Um, and when we did this large APOE by sex by SNP interaction, nothing reached genome-wide significance, so sort of, um, you know, 10 to the minus 8. Some stuff was close. Um, the actual uh, sort of QC and, and imputation uh, procedures are better now than they were even a year or two ago, and we're going to take a look at this and, and sort of um, revisit it. But for the time being, certainly nothing very prominent left out that was um, different between uh, men and women in terms of APOE interactions. Um, all right, and then a, a point that I was hoping would, would sort of blow everybody's mind, but now that David already spoke, maybe this won't blow people's mind, this wasn't really a full genome-wide association study. So all these studies that are called GWAS, I would say 99% of them are not actually genome-wide, right? So here's that same Manhattan plot that I showed you. Here's APOE on chromosome 19. Um, but what people never show is uh, the sex chromosome data. So this also blew my mind. This, in addition to the sex by APOE interaction, really shocked me. And when I started going, through these GWAS studies and, and understanding the methodology a little bit better, it very slowly dawned on me that none of these big Alzheimer's GWAS um, studies included the X chromosome. And that seems odd given that, as David pointed out, there are 2,000 or so genes, many of which are very important for, for cognition. Um, so uh, we have decided to undertake what will be, I hope, one of the first and largest um, XWAS studies, so instead of genome-wide association, X chromosome-wide association study. And the question is, why is this so rarely done? Uh, and there are a bunch of answers to that question. Um, as has been very beautifully pointed out this entire day, sex chromosomes are complicated. There's a pseudoosomal region that David talked about. There's this random in, uh, X inactivation in a given cell, either the maternal or the paternal X will be turned off. Um, but it turns out that this isn't necessarily all that random. And when you look at specific tissues, specific cell types, um, it, it doesn't appear as though it's a totally random procedure. Then, even more complicated, there can be skewing of X inactivation. So it may be that um, in certain people, the paternal X is turned off more than the maternal X is turned off. It's not a 50-50 uh, ratio. Um, and then, as David also mentioned, uh, it's estimated that about 15 or 20 percent of genes actually escape this X inactivation, right? So there are going to be big dosage effect differences between uh, men and women. Um, and I think the number one reason that this hasn't really been done is that it's, it's essentially like splitting your, your sample size in half. And so people have worked very hard to get these multi-site um, studies together in Alzheimer's and other disorders. Um, and instead of, you know, looking at 70,000 subjects, suddenly you're going to say, let's just look at 35,000 and 35,000. Um, so all of these are, are completely, you know, overcomable. None of these are, are sort of um, uh, deal breakers, I don't think. So we, we've sort of waded into this uh, morass, and I'll, I'll show you work that has really been spearheaded by Valerio uh, Napoleone, who's a postdoc in my lab, uh, and Ryan Kahn, who's my lab manager and a, a, a previous Stanford undergrad. All right, so let me walk you through some of the methods. You guys will bear in mind that I'm a, a neurologist, not a geneticist. There's been a lot of trickle-up learning, I have to say, from Valerio. Um, but what we did was conduct a meta-analysis um, of about 13,000 Northwestern Europeans from 13 data sets. Um, and then, uh, I think, sort of compellingly, we have a small replication cohort of about 531 Southeastern Europeans. These are all subjects from the ADGC that I, that I mentioned before, this widely used um, Alzheimer's disease genetics consortium data. Um, and then really the trick here, I think, was that Valerio was very careful about how he went uh, about 
doing quality control and imputation. So imputation means you know, your, your array may only give you 500,000 polymorphisms, but because of the correlated structure of these um, genetic changes, you can actually expand that into a million or two million different um, uh, SNPs. So that's what, what imputation means. Um, and imputation and, and quality control both are very uh, challenging on the X chromosome because most of the software that's been developed for this sort of stuff has been developed for autosomes. Um, but there is a new software called XWAS that, that Valerio spent a lot of time getting to know and, and, and talking to the creators about, and, and that's what he employed here. Um, and uh, uh, the other important point is that the, the imputation here for the X chromosome wasn't done with uh, the 1,000 genomes, but with this haplotype reference consortium or Michigan imputation server. The difference is 1,000 genomes use, Valeria tells me, something like 2,500 subjects. This uses more like 30,000 subjects, so your imputation is, is much finer, basically. All right, and then finally we did this uh, XWA testing with a logistic regression in each sex separately, and then we use this uh, Stouffer's meta-analysis method to combine p-values across the two sexes. Um, so what I'm going to show you are, are things that we're likely to have a significant p-value both in men and women. What we're missing here probably if there's an effect that was very strong in women and neutral in men, this particular analysis wouldn't pick that up. So that's more of the work to be done, basically. Um, all right, and then just a little word on the QC. Basically, there were a couple data sets that had very poor um, uh, QC in terms of the SNPs that, that uh, were successfully called, and we got rid of those two. Uh, these are GSK and WashU, and that left us with these 13 samples um, with a reasonable split between, um, uh, in most uh, data sets, between female cases um, and male cases and female controls and male controls. All right, and what we found, um, to, uh, I guess, to my surprise, maybe not to Valeria, were, were two uh, loci that reached genome-wide significance. So this is the, the sort of standard consensus red line uh, at uh, 10 to the minus 8, and then the blue line is this sort of, um, you know, suggestive cutoff that nobody really um, pays attention to. But two of these loci reached genome-wide significance on the X chromosome. Um, and then in, uh, this is just to show you that the data are pretty well behaved on the QQ plot. But in the replication cohort, I remember we kept out this, this group of about, um, uh, I think, 300 or so uh, Southeastern Europeans. Um, we only got one of the two uh, loci to replicate. So this is this DCAF 12L2 um, locus. So here's the, the data. This is the POF is interesting, and we're not done with this. This is the um, premature ovarian failure region, which might have some very obvious implications in terms of estrogen, for example, uh, in Alzheimer's. But it didn't replicate in our small replication cohort. Um, but if you look at the yellow bar here, the Northwestern European data is on the left uh, with this uh, e to the minus 10 um, p-value, and then in the Southeastern Europeans, even though it's a small sample, um, we get a p-value of, of 0.018. Um, the other thing to, to notice, particularly in Northwesterns, if you can see, I think it's the fourth column, um, the p-value tends to be much stronger in women here uh, than in men. So even though it's a combined meta-analysis with p-values from both sexes, it looks like this particular locus is being driven mainly by uh, the women. All right, and just zooming in on that locus, you can see our top hit there in purple with uh, a few SNPs nearby that are, are pretty in pretty high LD with it. Um, and a fair bit of, of recombination, so these blue peaks are the likelihood of recombination uh, at, at a given region on the X chromosome. And so it tends to be sort of a, a hot spot of recombination. Um, all right, so what do we know about this gene? Not a lot yet, um, but from our study, it looks like it increases risk for Alzheimer's disease both in men and women, but as I mentioned, the effect, um, even though the effect size is, is similar, it's a little bit bigger in women, 1.3, so about a 30 percent increased risk uh, uh, in women carrying this, which, you know, doesn't sound like much clinically, but a lot of the top hits um, that we see now, the odds ratios would be like 1.1, 1 1.15, 1 1.2, 1 so this is actually pretty sizable um, by GWAS uh, studies in Alzheimer's. Um, and it's a little, you know, we don't know yet if this is one of those genes that is, is known to escape X inactivation. Um, it looks as though when we, when we sort of hone in on women that carry two copies of this allele, um, their odds ratio tends to be more like three, so not 1.3 or 1.4, but much higher, which would make you think that there's sort of a dose effect uh, and that maybe this does escape X inactivation. We're going to try and look at that um, with some expression data. Um, and this is interesting, too. So there are only, as, at least as Valerio could find, only two um, retrogenes that are described on the X chromosome, and this is one of them. That means that there's another <coughs> sort of parental gene uh, that is, has been duplicated and, and is on the X chromosome here. 
Um, this gene's pretty well expressed or reasonably expressed in the brain. And the parental gene, the sort of original copy of this gene, uh, DCAF12, is on chromosome 9 and has actually been, uh, at least is in this uh, linkage region for frontal temporal dementia, which is a related um, disorder, distinct but um, with some similar features to Alzheimer's. Um, and importantly, that gene, um, the parental gene, encodes a, a protein that interacts with the, the COP9 signalosome, which basically interacts with um, ubiquitination and, and the proteasome, which is implicated in a lot of neurodegenerative disorders where we, we worry about protein aggregation. So, you know, as you guys probably know, any, any hit and any gene can always be linked through PubMed to, uh, you know, the disorder of interest, but there are some reasonably compelling links, I think, here that, that need some uh, further explore, exploration. Uh, and I mentioned that already. Okay. All right. So to wrap up, quasi on time. Um, it's definitely the case that, that prevalence of Alzheimer's disease is greater in, in, in women than men. And I think there's evidence that at least in older women, the incidence, um, the, the risk of, of newly developing Alzheimer's disease is also greater in women. Uh, I'm pretty convinced that, that the effect of E4 is greater in women than men. Um, I don't know how closely, I, I saw a lot of you appearing very closely at those um, survival curves. There, there was an interesting feature in there, which some of you might have picked up, which is that uh, women, if they carry two copies of the, the neutral E3 allele, actually do better than anybody, right? It's as though women are kind of protected, and it's just the E4 effect that's driving this uh, increased risk in women. I'm not, you know, that's not the, the, the question we were asking in that data set, but it, it's there in the data, and so it's, it's a complex, uh, I think, set of, of interactions. But I do feel that, that the E4 effect is greater in, in women than in men. Um, and, and again, I mentioned that could mean, based on the spinal fluid data that I showed you, either that amyloid misprocessing um, starts earlier in women uh, with an APOE4 allele than it does in men, or the amyloid effects are very similar between men and women, and it's the downstream effects on tau or on microglia or on inflammation related to amyloid that's different between um, uh, men and women in terms of uh, E4. Um, I showed you the, the APOE by sex by SNP uh, GWAS that didn't really show any significant um, effects, and I think that tells us that um, al although there could still be differences between men and women in other genes that interact with APOE, they're unlikely to be very prominent because with a reasonable sized um, GWAS, we didn't pick up any interactions. Um, and then I mentioned this uh, XWAS that we've performed that, that pulled out this um, interesting um, polymorphism on, on DCAF 12L2, uh, as well as this um, premature ovarian failure locus, which didn't replicate in our small data set, but which is trending that way and, and which may actually stick with um, still more data. Um, and the bottom line is, you know, we're, this is really literally just scratching the surface. I think there's a lot uh, more that can be asked and a lot more that can be learned about the biology of Alzheimer's disease if we paid much stricter attention to the differences uh, in men and women in risk, in longevity after diagnosis, um, in postmortem uh, changes that we see, for example. Um, so we're going to look, as I mentioned, at, still at this APOE by sex by SNP interaction with larger sample sizes and better imputation. Um, the other thing I didn't mention is that we didn't include uh, the X chromosome when we were looking for, the, for genes that interacted with APOE, so we're going to look at that. Um, and then I think it's probably still very helpful to think about doing um, these XWAS studies on, on the sexes completely separately. So I said we combine the p-values from the two in this Stouffer's uh, meta-analysis method, um, but that's going to miss things that are very strong in women but neutral or actually going in the other direction in men or vice versa. So there may be things that are purely um, sex-specific, and, and those uh, are worth pursuing, I think. All right, and then I'll just thank um, the people in my lab, obviously in particular Valerio, who's been driving this uh, XWAS, and then Andre Altman, who did the work on the, the conversion data, uh, as well as Ryan Kahn, collaborators here at Stanford, um, some of whom are in the audience here, uh, and funding with, you know, first and foremost, pride of place to the Wisdom Seed Grant that really got us started on this path, um, and also the the our recently minted Alzheimer's Disease Research Center uh, here at Stanford. And I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank